when you take time to think what's really important and who am I and why am I here? Now, everybody needs to think about things like that. I don't care if you're 20-something or 80-something or 90-something or 40-something or something. We need, to, we need to realize that well, just like Paul said, in, and I love, if you've not figured it out, the book of my Romans is probably my favorite book in the Bible. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Of course, I'm, I'm a theologian at heart. And for a lot of people, that's just as boring as watching paint dry. But for me, man, I just, I just love it. And, and so Paul really sums it up well in what I'm going to share with you about coming to a place of uh, totally abandoned to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, come to a place of total abandonment and realizing the singular purpose, the primary focus, the dot on the target that I'm aiming at centers upon the person and the work of God Almighty incarnate. His name is Jesus. Now, I know what it's, I, I, you know, I've been here almost 60 some odd years. And I know that it's real easy to get caught up in whatever our routine has become. And we live around our routine. And we live around, and when we live around our, when I live around my routine, I live around Bob. Now, you don't live around Bob. You live around who or whatever your name is. Now, look what Paul says in, first, or in Romans chapter 1, verses 14, 15, and 16. We're going to see three I am's here. He says, I am a debtor. I am a debtor. Both to Greeks and to the barbarians. Now, this is a nice way of saying to those who are educated and to those who aren't. Okay? That's what he's saying there in the context of the first century. To be considered a Greek meant that uh, Greek was the language of commerce like English is today on the earth. Greek was then. And he says, so if you're intelligent enough to communicate with everybody who comes your way, because if they're not a barbarian, they can understand Greek. Regardless of whether they're a Roman or a Jew or an Arab or whoever they were. He says, I'm a debtor. Both to the educated and the uneducated. Both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me. Now you see his total abandonment to his purpose. As much as is in me. I am ready. There's the second I am. I'm ready. I'm available. I, I, I'm committed. I'm in it whole hog. I'm in it with both feet. I'm there. I'm in. I'm ready to preach, to proclaim, to advocate, to advance, to supplement, to come alongside and help, to lead the way or help someone else lead and follow. I'm ready to preach the gospel, the good news. The only message that will set men and women free that will cleanse us of sin and keep us from hell and take us from heaven. The gospel to you who are at Rome also. They never been to Rome. He's heading that way. He's going to get a haircut. About right there. They're going to separate his head from his body because he was a Roman. 
You couldn't, ha- you couldn't crucify a Roman. Couldn't hang him. You, 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 the, the quick, swift, they thought painless. I don't want to find out. Now, not the way these barbarians are doing it now with a knife and saw in it. Uh, this was quick and, and boom. And it was over with. He says, then he says, here's the third I am. He says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not sidetracked. I am not caught in my routine of life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ, the anointed one, the only begotten Son of God, the virgin-born sinless one who did for us what none of us could do for ourselves and fulfilled the righteous demands of God's holy law that he gave to his servant Moses. It killed us. It condemned us. It did all those things, but it could not save us. Just stayed judgment a little bit farther down the road. You know, we talk about Congress kicking the can down the road. That's all the law did. It just kicked the can down the road. Didn't deal with it until Jesus dealt with it at the cross. And he says, for it is the power, power, it's the power. You see, God's the one who does the work. It is the power of God. It's from God, of God, for God, through God, to God. And bless God, he includes us. Somebody better write that down. To everyone, not, not just the men or not just the women or just not white folk or black folk or Hispanic folk, but everyone who believes, who, who, who exercises faith. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Now, don't forget, to the Jew first, why? The Jew's the apple of God's eye. They're the chosen people. They're special. That's not fair. Who said God was fair? God's God. Everything God does is right. And he chose Abraham down through Isaac, down through Jacob, down through his 12 sons, all the way... That group, that line, that stream of people, that genetic part of humanity and gave us the eternal, inerrant, infallible word of Almighty God. And through that gave us our Savior and his name is Jesus. And so to the Jew first, we have an obligation. To the Jew first, we do. We do. Because, you see, Jews can't go to heaven unless they get saved. I mean, nobody can go to heaven unless they're born again. Jesus said, I'm the, the, I'm the only way to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You can't get to the Father except through me. And thank God, record numbers of, of Jewish people are coming to Christ. Can I tell you, Christianity is not a new religion. It is just completed, fulfilled Judaism. Do you understand? Don't, don't hate the Jew. You're doing the devil's work when you do. You hate Jesus if you hate the Jews because Jesus was a Jew. Do you hear what I'm saying? To the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the non-Jew. Okay? Here he's using Greek in a different sense. He's not separating the educated from the uneducated. He's separating the Jew from the non-Jew. And then look what he says in verse 17. For in it, in what? The gospel. In it, the gospel. In it, the gospel. 
The righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel, the good news about Jesus, the anointed one, the Messiah, living his perfect life, started with a perfect birth, lived a perfect life, fulfilled a perfect ministry, fulfilled all those many, many prophecies. I mean, it, I mean, the odds of one person doing this by chance, I, I saw this thing where it was one in 10 and then 2,700 zeros after it. In other words, it's impossible for it to happen by chance. It had to be orchestrated by God himself. And he says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God. You see, we don't have any. Can I tell you, you don't have any righteousness on your best day? The prophet Isaiah tells us that our righteousnesses, I think it's, I think it's Isaiah 64, 4. Don't, 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 it's in, it's in there. He says, our righteousnesses, not just our righteousness, but our righteousnesses, our attempt to be good and holy and perfect within the flesh, our, our attempt is nothing but filthy rags in the sight of God. And that word filthy rag is a medical term, a bandage that they would put over an infected wound. In other words, your best attempt of measuring up is like a pus-filled rag. I know that's not real pleasant. You see how much we need Jesus, how much he loves us, and how much he wants to use us, how much he, wa he wants to be so preeminent in our lives. He doesn't want to be a tag-along. He does not want to be an addendum but he wants, uh, he, he wants for us to make him our all in all. Wh whether we where we live, where we recreate, where we work, our vocation, our family life, our everything. He says, and it's for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, from common faith. Everyone has that faith. That kind of faith that can bring you to salvation. That faith that says, you know, I, uh, you know, you hear the word proclaim, the Holy Spirit does his work, and he, draw, he convinces you, he convicts you, he draws you, he troubles you, and shows you your helplessness, your hopelessness, your dire situation, and the fact that you have no way out except receiving the gift that the Father gives you through his Son the Lord Jesus. The gospel, the good news, his, his, the righteousness that he gives to everyone that will repent and believe. You know, the church today, uh, we, we're, we've kind of got off track. You know, throughout the scripture, we see that confrontation now, don't look at that as a negative way, thing. To confront, to bring up before someone. That's confrontation. It doesn't have to be ugly. It doesn't have to be mean. But to bring the truth into the situation that lost people need to be saved. And sin separates us from God. But we were born... We were born, I know there's no such word as born, born, That's the, the Germans fooled with English a little bit, it's a long story, I'm not going to tell you, 
We were born in sin. We were born with a sin nature. We have the propensity to sin. We have the bent toward... Ah! I'm one I think I feel. But the Lord remedied that and took our sin and broke the presence, the power, and the purpose of sin in, in the life of the believer. And we don't, have to be, we don't have to live shackled any longer. We don't have to live under the burden and the curse of that sin any longer. So it's revealed from faith, saving faith. Oh, to faith. What's this other kind of faith? A serving faith. A sacrificing faith. A submitted faith. A faith that will take you to levels in Christ that you cannot experience and will not understand until you come to the place that this message is entitled... Total, totally abandoned to the gospel of Jesus Christ. To come to a place where you are totally, you know, I'm here for you. I might have to dig a ditch or drive a truck or sling a hammer or I, I, might, I might be instructing people in a, in a classroom. I might, whatever it is I do, whatever it is you do, is secondary to the fact that your purpose, that why you were born and why, why you are on the earth is for him. It's for him. I don't care if you're down at the beach on vacation. Everybody needs a vacation. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, but you're there. Everybody needs to recharge. Everybody needs a rest. But you're there for him. You're there for him. That doesn't mean that you have to go and kick sand in everybody's face along the beach saying, are you saved? But God will give you opportunities. He'll give you appointments. He'll give you. He'll open the door. From faith, from common faith, a faith that will save you to a faith that will use you. A faith that will make you a drink offering. And what is a drink offering Un under the old covenant? It, you, buddy, you were poured out completely. The drink offering was poured out unto the Lord for his glory and for his purpose. That's what it's all about. I didn't think I was going to make it through this introduction. You see, Paul implored us to follow him as he followed Jesus. In, I think it's 1 Corinthians 11. Did I? Yeah, verse 1. Look what he says. He says, now he's telling the church at Corinth, and let me tell you something. If there was, uh, let's see, how can I say this? Every church on the face of the earth has a level of dysfunction. Just like every family on the face of the earth is dysfunctional. Every family I find in the Bible was dysfunctional. Now, what do you mean by that? I mean that we're not perfect and we didn't have it all together all the time. I hate to bust some of your bubbles. But the truth will set you free. And he says, and, and I'd say the church at Corinth was probably the most dysfunctional church you're going to find in the Scripture. If it's not, it's number two. And I'd like to know what number one is. I mean, my goodness, when you have a man in the church who's involved in a sexual relationship with his stepmother, and nobody... I mean, it's the elephant in the room, and nobody will say a thing about it. That's pretty dysfunctional, isn't it? 
Mercy. Mercy. Confront. And when you confront, there's conviction. Now, a lot of, now, the people who don't think you ought to talk about both sides of the coin, they say, oh, that's condemnation. You shouldn't condemn. I don't have to condemn. We're condemned already. I'm just, we're just to point out the truth, to confront. And, and when confrontation is given, when the proclamation is made, then the conviction, the condemnation will be evident in the recipient of the message of the love of God and the gift of God given to Christ, through Christ, to us. And then we can let them know about the love. Why, what Jesus done, that's an act of love. Amen? But today, all we want to talk about is love and nothing about confrontation or conviction. Nowhere in the Word of God does it tell us. You know, we, we have to demonstrate love. Anybody can talk about love. But we have to demonstrate love if the world's going to see love in action. Amen? And so, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, uh, in, in Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, Paul on the road to Damascus, I mean, he's, he's wreaking havoc at the church in Jerusalem, and he heard that there were some of those followers of Jesus in Damascus, and he got some arrest warrants. And he's going to go up there, and he's going to find any of these people. They were 99% Jews still. So he got it from the any Jew... He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna arrest, and if they lived through it and got him back to Jerusalem, then they were really going to be mean to him. And when the Lord slapped him down off his horse and spoke to him, everybody with him thought it was thunder. But Jesus, speaking to, to Saul, he was still named as, and told him what... And Saul, who became Paul, asked two questions. Who are you? <laughs> I'd want to know who just flattened me, wouldn't you? Who, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And then verse 6 says he's trembling and, and, and he's astonished. Well, now I know who you are, Jesus. Next question ought to be, once you know Jesus, is what do you want me to do? Have you asked yourself that question lately? What are you supposed to do in the ministry of this congregation of, that God has planted you in? What is your ministry here in this house? You know, children or or, or uh, you know, uh, pre preschool, or 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 elementary, or middle school, or 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 high school, or or some adult ministry. What is your ministry? Do you know Jesus? Well, how often do you ask him what do you, what does he want you to do? Now you know why people don't ask that because their routine dictates everything their, the desires uh, their want you know the desires of a, you know, lust of the eyes lust of the flesh pride of life our, and that's, that's what f too often that's what makes our schedules that is what charts our course that's what establishes our routine who are you oh Jesus okay well what do you want me to do Rise, go to the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Now, I, do you notice that Jesus didn't say, well, now, 
I want you to go down uh, down yonder and 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 you're going to meet and 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 then and you're going to go out here and you're going to go to Bible school out in the desert for a while and then you're going to go up here and you're going to start teaching and then I'm going to send Barnabas and you're going to come down here and then we're going to we're going to send you on a mission trip and you're going to do all he didn't tell him all that you see it's you're in the military now if you're saved you're in the army of the Lord and everything you need to do is on a need to know basis Now, my son just told me yesterday that his orders have been tweaked a little bit. He's going to another Air Force base in Turkey. That's a whole lot closer to where the fighting is. Matter of fact, it's not even American Air Force Base. It's a Turkish Air Force Base. That don't put my heart at ease at any. You understand? But it was on a need to know basis. I just knew six months ago he's going to Turkey. And then I thought he was going to Ursinik near Adana. And now he's going to this other place that I'm not going to name it. It's on a need to know basis. Now I'm telling you, my God's going to be there. And God can keep him just as safe there as he could on that American Air Force Base. You know what I'm saying? It's on a need-to-know basis. What do you want me to do, Lord? I know who you are now. What, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? Knowing who Jesus is and knowing what he'd have us to do, and then following him correctly. Following him. That, that is the key if we're to understand life's meaning. You're not going to understand. You're not going to get a full grasp and a greater understanding of who you really are and why you are really here until that becomes real in your life. You know, you remember, remember when you were 15? Do you remember when you were 25? <laughs> I remember when I was 20-something. I thought I was the smartest man on earth. And then God got a hold of my heart. I've been wondering too long, and God got a hold of my heart. And I realized that my eighth grade educated daddy was probably one of the smartest men I ever met in my life. He got a whole lot smarter. I used to think he was dumber than a rock. Man, he just wasn't with it. And then I realized that there was wisdom under that wavy hair. There was wisdom between those ears. There was knowledge of God that was in his heart. And I needed what he wanted to, been trying to give me. But I needed. And thank God he poured it into me. Do you understand? If you want to know your life's meaning, you got to know that you know who Jesus is. And then you got to know and come to a place of surrender and submission and obedience and say, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You know, I'll get saved, I'll get baptized, I'll become part of the church family, I'll serve, I'll, I'll give, I'll tithe, I'll, I'll help, I'll, I'll, I'll go on mission trips or help others go that, that want to go. 
I'll, I'll work in VBS. I'll, I'll help in the children's church. I'll help in Sunday school. I'll, I'll work in the media ministry. I'll let, help ca take up the offering. I'll do whatever I need to do. I'll, God's got a place for me, and I'm willing to serve. I want to serve. And, and, and inevitably, it's not the doing only, but the, op, op, the opportunity to proclaim, to speak out the gospel. Do, do you understand? I know there's a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't say nothing about Jesus. I just live it out. Well, then, okay, what, do you come to church to see me just walk around? Or do I, do I have to say something? Duh. Speak. Speak. Paul's example in Romans 1 shows us what it means to be totally abandoned to the gospel of Jesus Christ. My goodness, we're not going to get done because honest, I just now finished the introduction. Whew. Paul was faithful to the obligations of the gospel. We saw, we saw back here in verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and the unwise. You see, I'm a debtor. In, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, the Scripture says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple, the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and... Now, we forget this all the time. You are not your own. You're not your own. You don't have a right to get drunk. You don't have a right to engage in sexual sin. If you're saved, you're not your own. You've been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. You're no longer a slave to the devil. You're a son of the living God. He says, for you are bought at a price, verse 20. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Everything about you belongs to him. And yet he doesn't treat us like a slave. He treats us as sons and daughters. He treats us as, our, as a, his cherished cherished possession. He cherishes us. He loves us. He cares for us. Paul knew his obligation to the gospel. We're debtors to the one who gave himself for us. He gave himself for us. This is not trying to pay for our salvation. You can never earn salvation. We don't deserve it, but the price has already been paid in full. And it was paid at the cross. And God said he was good and he rose from the dead. You see, he was obligated to the gospel. This, ref this will reflect our love for our Lord by surrender and service. That's what that reflects. People say, oh, I love Jesus. I can... Ooh. I got to bite the end of my tongue off sometime because I want to say, well, let's go back here and look at the records. Do you tithe? Uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't keep a running record. Now, your deacon will try to keep up with you. I'm just warning you. You know, if you're here on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, they, keep a, they try to keep a running tally. You know, they do that because they love you. But I don't have a clue how often, you know, I can't tell you exactly how often anybody's when and where and how and all that, you know. But God does. Boy, ain't that a... God knows. Say, oh, how I love Jesus. I'll see you once a month. I 
I'm going to have to get a bus. That really hurt. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. I, I'm going to say this before I close. I'm not even beginning to start. We're debtors. We're debtors to the Lord Jesus. And we're debtors to the past. You know, when Stephen, the deacon, he was a preaching deacon, by the way. Matter of fact, he was a windy old bird. You ought to read his message. Man, he must have preached an hour and a half, two hours. We know that he preached one message. And it must have been not politically correct, and it definitely was not seeker-friendly because they killed him for it. They took him out and they stoned him to death. And there was a, a Pharisee there. He says, oh, go ahead, boys, go, go to it. I'll, I'll watch your coats. His name was Paul. Well, he became Paul the Apostle. He was Saul the Pharisee. And you see, he, he held the clothing of those who stoned Stephen. Paul became really the first Christian missionary in a, a very, um, well, recorded notable sense. Yes, I know the, 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 uh, the original uh, 11, the, uh, the, the original ones. I know they went, you know, Thomas went to India. I, I know they went all over North Africa. They went, they went at many different places. Every one of them died a violent death except the Apostle Paul, or the Apostle John. But we see, I want you to think this through. Paul had a debt to Stephen. Because Stephen, he stood his ground and he preached the truth and he said, Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah. And don't be like our fathers, our forefathers, who rebelled against the prophets and, and they killed some of them back yonder. He said, don't you be uncircumcised in heart and stiff-necked. Jesus is the way. Come to him. And the, drove them nuts. They hated it. Why? Because they loved their sin. Paul had a debt to Stephen. And as they were stoning him to death, Stephen said, Jesus, don't lay this sin to their charge. And then he said, I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. <laughs> Glory to God. You see, when you're on a throne, you don't stand. You see it. But Jesus so loved Stephen that he, he, just as he can see us right now, he saw Stephen, and he stood to his feet, and he said, Come on home, boy. Come, my son. Come. Whew. And the angels whisked, whew, right? I mean, whoo, breath down there. <gasps> Next breath up there. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And, you know, we can think of, you know, if, if you have a heritage of Christianity in your family tree, you need to thank them. You need to thank your mother or your daddy or both of them, hopefully, you know. But too often in, in generations past, it was one or the other. It most likely was mom. Rarely was it dad and not mom. 
Do you understand? And if you got a mother that's still on the earth, and she wash your ears out and get you ready and drag you to church, thank God you were on a, you had that kind of drug problem. Like she drug you to the church. Uh, and then you got up and teenager and thought you knew something when you was dumber than a box of rocks. Not all teenagers are dumb. Just the ones I know. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> you better thank God for that mother, that daddy. And they probably had a mom or a mother-in-law or both. Who saw to it that the church house doors were open and the bell was rung. I think of my family. I had a grandmother that just loved Jesus. I mean, it was down to just those two on prayer meeting night on Wednesday night. But they had her open there every Wednesday night. And they walked about a, a half a mile, a three quarters of a mile down, down the holler, down to the church house, and rung that old church bell. I can still hear it ring today. I miss church bells. That's why my phone rings at church bell. You say, I don't have a godly heritage like that. Well, start one. Start one. Start one. And you say, well, I, I kind of do, but there was bumps in the road. Listen, everybody's got bumps in the road. I mean, does the state keep the highway paved perfectly all the time? There's a hole to hit every now and then. Just... You don't quit. You just keep on rolling down the highway. Amen. I'm a debtor. We'll have to talk about ready and ashamed some other day. I want you to know you had a debt that you could not pay. But it's been paid for you. You need to take time to thank him. You need to take time to praise him. You need to take time to say thank you, Jesus. And realize that the debt you have, somebody, somebody, you know, in 1965, when this congregation started as a mission out of another church, there was a nucleus of people they couldn't see what all was going to happen, but they knew God wanted to do something. And they were obedient. And I think 1967, they constituted as an as a autonomous congregation. And in the life of that church, like, like every church, they got their ups and downs. But we're here today because... There were people who went before us who realized they had a debt. If their children and their grandchildren and maybe even their grandchildren needed a place that was true to the word and would preach the gospel and stand upon the word of God and love people where they are and tell them the truth, don't let them stay in darkness, but to tell them the truth that God loves you and he knows all there is to know about you and he can make right in your life everything that's wrong. If you'll humble yourself and come to him and then really find out the purpose in life for you, come to a place of surrender and service. Get saved and then surrender your life Come to a place of total commitment, total abandonment of self-will. And, Lord, I don't, 
I give my dreams to you, and you help me dream in the way you'd have me to go.